and good day. Welcome to the FDA Oncology Center of Excellence. This is Conversations on Cancer, which is a public panel discussion series that we do here at the OCE, as we lovingly refer to ourselves. I'm Rhea Blakey. I'm the Associate Director for External Outreach and Engagement here at OCE, and I am joined with, by an illustrious panel that has a really special mission today. This is a special edition of a conversation on cancer. Uh, typically, we do tend to deal with issues that have to do with uh, socially related issues regarding cancer. Uh, we often have patient advocates involved in our conversations on cancer, but today we're doing something different. It is, in fact, unique. Our topic is how biotech built a blockbuster cancer drug. Uh, the person who we thought might be best suited to talk about that happens to be an author. Some of you may know. Uh, we do have a couple of disclaimers to go through, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, we thought that it might be helpful for you to have an idea as to why Conversations on Cancer actually exists. And for that, we will turn to our OCE Center Director, Rick Pazder, who is here to explain. Hey, Rick. Uh, thank you, Rhea. Uh, Conversations on Cancer began several years ago, and it really was to bring the FDA's Oncology Center of Excellence to the community, uh, to have an intersection between uh, patients drug developers and drug regulators. And we've had a variety of topics that we discussed, as Rhea mentioned, uh, including uh, specific diseases, regulatory issues, health disparity issues, just to name a few. But it really is the intersection between what we do here at the FDA, how it affects our core stakeholders, and that includes patients, uh, the American public in general, uh, as well as regulated industry. So so this is a kind of, as, as Rhea mentioned, a special edition of Conversations on Cancer, and we're uh, really interested in delving into the topic that was presented in Nathan Martney's book on, uh, on the subject. So I'll turn it over to Jenny Gao. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jenny. I'm the Associate Director for Education in the FDA Oncology Center of Excellence. And as Rhea alluded to, we have a couple of disclaimers before we introduce Nathan and get to the discussions. Nathan was not compensated in any way for his joining us today on this Conversations on Cancer, and the invitation to speak today does not reflect an endorsement of him, his book, and it also does not reflect the views of the agency, but rather of the individual participants. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nathan to briefly introduce himself and also start us off by saying a little bit about what the book is for anyone in the audience who may be unfamiliar with it. You'll know that we're all addressing each other by first names because this is meant to be a casual conversation. So Nathan. Thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, it's really great to be at the FDA. Uh, we had a terrific uh, session with some of the staff uh, this morning, um, and it's really great to participate in this in this event as well. Um, I wrote this book. Uh, it's called uh, For Blood and Money. And the book is about the development of two rival cancer drugs that have made a real difference for patients, uh, particularly patients uh, with chronic lymphocytic leukemia which is the most common form of adult leukemia. Um, and the book, I think at its core, is about the people uh, who help make this happen. Uh, you know, th the book is about, um, you know, committed professionals uh, who are human beings. And as a result, they're flawed, they're not, they're not perfect. Um, and uh, they have different motivations. Um, some of them wanted to uh, 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 participate uh, in this endeavor because they were personally touched by cancer and um, they were trying to make sense of the world and, and uh, find a way forward in it. Um, some of them uh, were motivated uh, for other reasons. Uh, some of them uh, were looking for uh, professional um, enhancement. Uh, uh, some of them uh, were, were trying, were motivated by also by money. Uh, some of them uh, were, were um, you know, some of them were more successful than others. Some of them got fired. Some of them were promoted. Uh, some of them um, made more money. Some of them made less money. Um, but they were all at the end doing something that uh, was benefiting patients uh, and, and made a real difference for them. And so in a way, I was trying to reverse engineer, like, how is it that we create 
cancer medications and get them to patients in this environment? How, what does that actually look like uh, in reality? Uh, and that's, that's really what I was trying to do. And I'll just say, it's also a story about the innovation of BTK inhibitors and the science behind BTK inhibitors, the two drugs that I write about in the book, Brutinib and Acalabrutinib, uh, were the first um, uh, BTK inhibitors that were approved by this agency. Um, and so the book is also about that as well. I found it very interesting because throughout the book, there's fascinating characters and some of them we've met, okay, uh, on the other side of the table. And uh, I, one of the reasons that I really wanted this conversation is here at the FDA, we see what goes on at the FDA in our meetings, but we generally don't see what goes on behind the scenes in a drug company. Uh, and I was fascinated by the read here uh, of this book because it does illustrate the interactions of of what goes on. And this was primarily with uh, relatively small startup biotech companies and then obviously involvement of larger biotech companies. And we do see different behaviors that uh, are quite evident to the review staff here when we interact with a larger pharmaceutical company that perhaps has a, a large portfolio, a long history with the agency versus uh, a, a smaller startup company. And it was really fascinating to see uh, what goes on in those companies. And I guess, you know, one of the first questions I have, who were your favorite characters in this whole scenario of these two drugs? It's okay if you say Rick. <laughs> <laughs> it's mentioned in the book. Yes. Um, I, you know, uh, Rick and I, uh, Rick was kind enough to have dinner with me last night. And uh, during dinner, he asked me, you know, who, who are the heroes in this book anyway? Mm -hmm. And uh, I told you that I, I think they're all heroes. Um, you know, um, ultimately, um, I liked all of the characters in this book, um, and you know they all did something together that they just could never possibly do uh, on their own, uh, and they all kind of brought something else to to the table. Um, you know, I I I really enjoyed the time that I got to spend with Ahmed Hamdi, uh, who is um, kind of the connective tissue, mm -hmm. uh, and Raquel Azumi as well, who has long been his, his uh, business partner. Um, they, were, um, the, the, they were involved in the development of both of these drugs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in and fact, so they actually thread throughout the entire book. They're introduced in the beginning and mm -hmm. were working on what became a Brutinib, mm -hmm. and then later on what became a Calabrutinib, which is an interesting story how these people kind of recycled their their talent, so to speak, after being some summarily dismissed from one company and forming a, uh, another uh, company. And it was kind of a fascinating thing to see how people were involved with really the entire development of the class of a drug, not just a specific drug, but really the class yeah. of a drug. Ra Ra Raquel, uh, I think, wrote just about every uh, protocol for every, every uh, uh, trial uh, for both of these drugs. Um, and one of the points I want to make also, and, and here again, because we have a, a patient audience, the real heroes are the patients that participated right. in the clinical trials, okay? And I really want to emphasize that. Uh, and as you can see on some of our recent ODACs, we really have been acknowledging uh, the part of patients and acknowledging their role in drug mm -hmm. development. And it, frequently um, that kind of gets lost in people's names and uh, titles, et cetera. But we really want to emphasize that the entire development scheme, none of this would be possible without uh, the patient participation in the trial. Yeah, and I dedicated the book to the patients who, who participate in clinical trial. You're right, they are the true heroes uh, behind any drug development uh, story, but particularly cancer drug development story. Could I just ask the question, because I'm sure there are some people who have not read the book, um, but might be wondering why this particular subject matter. Uh, you know, there are fascinating characters. There, there's a lot to cancer drug development that people, I mean, listen, I work here and I don't know it all by any stretch, but why biotech? Why this particular mm -hmm. really extreme story? Uh, well, uh, to, first of all, as a journalist, I'll tell you that all I'm really looking for in life is a good good story, <laughs> and and at its core, that's what I think this book is about. Um, uh, I'm currently the managing editor uh, for enterprise uh, journalism at MarketWatch, um, 
And but during the period when the events of this book took place, I was a senior editor at Forbes magazine, um, where I was mostly essentially uh, responsible for the coverage of uh, Wall Street uh, and particularly big investors. Um, and so as a result, I got to see um, a lot of my world was not narrow, it was very, very wide. And I got to see um, a lot of different industries as these investors participated in investments in different industries. So oil, it could be healthcare, it could be high technology. And between the period of 2010 and 2020, uh, the area that I enjoyed covering the most, the, the area that I thought was having the, the biggest impact on human beings was biotechnology. Uh, you know, this agency approved almost 400 new cancer, uh, 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 drugs during uh, that period. A lot of them were oncology medicines. Not all of them were great, but but some of them some of them were. We we got to we're honest. We about we that. have to like yeah. approve or not approve yeah. what comes to us. Of we course. don't have yeah. a say of right. what what is developed. And I think people sometimes don't understand that our role is somewhat of a passive role and we we have to take an application no matter if it's good or bad sometimes and uh, uh, a incremental advantage or perhaps no advantage but just equally as good as something else that's on the market and but the, the, the drugs that I write about in this book I think were extraordinary are extraordinary mm -hmm. drugs that have really made mm -hmm. uh, a difference and you know if you think about that period uh, from a you know financial market perspective um, that was the period of um, fang you know uh, the big uh, technology companies, the big technology uh, communication revolution that was taking place. Um, and, you know, those innovations are great. I love those innovations. Like, I love sitting on the couch with my family uh, watching Netflix. Like, that is really terrific and has improved my life uh, dramatically. They didn't give us any money for this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know, I'm not, but Netflix is okay, right? I can say Netflix, right? Disclaimer, it's already been stated. Yeah, I think not, it's a regulated industry. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. okay. It's not ours. <laughs> but, but, um, um, as much as I enjoy those innovations, I felt that what I was seeing, this kind of biotech boom, you know, golden age of biotech, whatever you want to call it, uh, that was taking place was having a really profound impact uh, on human beings. And, and um, also in the markets, you know, the, the biotech stocks outperform the high technology stocks from a percentage not in, in absolute, but in a percentage uh, basis uh, during this period. Um, so it was, a, it was a time of great innovation and, and so Nathan, why, a lot of Nathan, why, why did we have this innovation now? Right. Why, what happened? Why, why now and like, was it what forces came together, so to speak? I have my own opinion on that. I'd love to hear yours. I, I do think, you know, I think for this story, um, you know, there were advances in tyrosine kinase chemistry mm -hmm. uh, that I think uh, that happened, you know, before 2010, that I think had a very profound impact. Um, and we saw that in a number of products that uh, got to patients, you know, the decade after those mm -hmm. innovations took place. So I think that was a very important part of this story. Uh, the BTK inhibitors that I write about are, are TKIs. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think um, part of it was that you had um, this kind of change in the industry where the smaller biotechnology companies took the baton in innovation from the larger pharmaceutical companies, and they were able in the capital markets uh, to finance themselves. And, and why? Because the pharmaceutical, larger pharmaceutical companies were just the Titanic, so to speak, or too big to... I, I think that... Too big to fail? I think or, the, or either, they bought the smaller just, companies, just couldn't, as you Just mentioned. couldn't maneuver because of uh, bureaucracy, basically, you know, Many people know that I'm highly critical of bureaucracy, even here in the agency. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I could imagine the same thing exists in a large pharmaceutical company where you need 10 different people to sign off on this, where it's obvious, so to speak, and somebody has to give their opinion, another person has to give their opinion, and that doesn't lead to nimble drug development, and that may be part of it. I think that the, that the smaller companies were able to be more nimble. They were able to focus on, you know, narrowly on a few products, really gal galvanize their efforts around them. Um, so I think that that definitely played a role. Um, and, the, and suddenly they were able to really finance themselves because of uh, what was going on in the financial markets. So I think that's another reason why we saw a lot of this in innovation. I think that um, there were some very creative um, changes uh, on the political and regulatory front that helped 
uh, uh, this innovation take place. Um, I write about Breakthrough, for example, uh, which uh, the, the um, the drugs, the ibrutinib, I think, was the one of the first uh, uh, drugs to participate in the breakthrough program. I know it was the first drug, I think, to get three breakthrough designations. Um, so I think those innovations on the regulatory front also uh, played a really important role. So a lot of things, I think, came together uh, to produce this outcome. And I'm hoping that we'll see that again in the next decade, that we'll see How much we'll see do you think was due to chance, though? Because you mentioned in there, you know, they happen to come up on this drug, for example, from the Dutch or you know, a large company may acquire a lot of drugs and then sell the rights to some of them and then realize when it does develop that uh, maybe they shouldn't have. How much is that due to chance? How much is it due to risk willingness of small companies versus you also write about larger companies that were more interested in acquiring smaller companies because there was no risk? They already knew that it worked. The, 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 game of the, game, the, the name of the game is so, so much as risk management yep. well, and, another and reason, your degree of, of risk. Another reason we had a lot of innovation in cancer medicines is a tremendous amount of money yes. uh, was invested in this in research and development around oncology mm -hmm. more than any other therapeutic and yeah. number two wasn't even close um, and yet it's amazing to what degree with all this money and science and innovation luck plays mm -hmm. in the development of a cancer medication and this is a great example um, there was a lot of serendipity and a lot of luck mm -hmm. ibrutinib was absolutely a forgotten drug uh, it literally was uh, some grudge uh, on the bottom of a test tube mm -hmm. it wasn't even patented um, and it was literally fished out uh, from another uh, company um, in order to start this development mm -hmm. process. Um, there were so many serendipitous things that happened. Um, you know, Dr. Richard Miller uh, helped uh, at the early stages of Ibrutinib's development. And, um, you know, he was a lymphoma guy. Mm -hmm. And um, he had the idea of maybe trying this tool compound, uh, Ibrutinib, that had been developed with an eye towards uh, rheumatoid arthritis, right. you thought maybe maybe we should try this in blood cancer and particularly uh, lymphoma. Um, and in the f phase one trial, uh, he the, the first trial he included uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia patients, right. not because he thought that um, this drug was going to work in CLL, uh, but because he thought the assays would be easier to conduct with those patients. And then when those mm -hmm. patients received the drugs, they got some partial responses. And that's how this whole story kind of uh, uh, began. So it's amazing to me with all of the money and science and innovation and talent, it's a tremendous amount of talent in this industry, um, that luck plays a, an enormous, mm -hmm. enormous role. Yeah. And again, back to the patients and their involvement. Well, for sure, yeah, if they're not in, involved in yeah. those trials. But, but in contrast to, say, uh, drugs that were traditional cytotoxic drugs, mm -hmm. which were kind of uh, just developed on the basis of um, uh, you know, uh, some uh, in vitro cell death cytotoxic uh, cytotoxic activity. We really had a target here, mm -hmm. and that could be viewed and studied, so to speak. So that led to some important developments as far as even dosing. Because here again in the book, and this is a, a problem that we're facing and as we go forward in drug development is what is the right dose of the drug and as many of you know that we've launched several projects here in OCE and one of them is Project Optimist to look at uh, appropriate dosing of drugs but there was this conflict mm -hmm. even in the book regarding abrutinib I believe with should you use kind of the dose that they were using based on kind of the, the basic science of the, the receptor and the drug versus an MTD approach that had been conventionally used in oncology. And balancing safety and toxicity. Yeah. And they, they actually then went with a more rational drug development program. Because here again, if they went with a more higher dose, who knows what would have happened? Greater cardiac toxicity that could have killed the drug. Right. Greater problems with the patient. Well, ultimately, acceptance. they did do it. Uh -huh. And, and the, the, they did get a little uh -huh. bit more toxicity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, that concerns some of the uh -huh. executives about how that would be uh -huh. interpreted in the marketplace, uh -huh. uh, less with the regulators, uh, I think. Um, but um, those issues were definitely part of this 
of this. Why do you think, Rick, there was so much innovation uh, during this period? I, I think it and what was, can we do to make sure we get that same innovation over the next decade? I, I think it, ultimately it involves uh, investment in basic sciences, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, remember, it's a pyramid with the clinical development at the top, mm -hmm. but we really have to have an understanding of uh, the basic sciences and uh, scientific underpinnings, not only of the disease, okay, as we're seeing here with targeted therapies, but uh, with biological th therapies, how our body reacts mm -hmm. to a given malignancy and how we could augment that, those effects. So it's really a, 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 a not just a serendipitous, uh, you know, chance chance happening. It, it's really a, a situation where we uh, have built this uh, on a, a platform that has been through several decades here through various funding mechanisms, R1 grants, et cetera, that really uh, underline some of these basic scientific understandings. Uh, you know, I've been in oncology now too long, perhaps, <laughs> some people might think, but, uh, you know, over 40 years, and when we were developing traditional cytotoxic drugs, people used to go to the rainforest to look at sea urchins, to uh, the bottom of the seas, whatever, to see if they could identify compounds that would simply kill cells, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was totally like the, the, the drug development picture was trying to find a needle in the haystack, so to speak. Uh, and that was going to just lead to either a lot of marginal drugs or drugs that were just going to be abandoned because uh, they simply did not work in oncology. But here again, with an understanding of targeting the drugs to a specific molecular uh, target, uh, things have changed here. And that's why we saw, you know, the first advance probably that led this revolution obviously was in CML with imatinib. Uh, and that kind of started this cascade moving forward. Uh, and from my point of view, this has been one of the most rewarding things in my career uh, to see patients that when I started my career that would have died relatively quickly of a disease now having life expectancies that match the, uh, you know, normal population or the, uh, the general population. So, you know, there can be tremendous advances when one really understands the disease itself mm -hmm. and then targeting mm -hmm. drugs to be specific rather and than there are still general, patients like, finding this. Who are in the early Ibrutinib tribes yeah. who are alive today, mm -hmm. over, well over a decade later, uh, mm -hmm. which is really uh, amazing. Um, I, I can't let you off the hot uh -huh. Um, you mentioned <laughs> yes. Project Optimus. Um, some of the people I talk to um, in the pharma and, and biopharma world um, are a little worried about the uh, amount of time uh, and complexity, uh, not to mention money, uh, that Optimus uh, will... It's always about money. It's always about money. That's, <laughs> okay. that's what I call for my book, blood For Blood and, and Money. money. Yeah. Um, um, you know, but they, I, think there's, I think the worries are sincere. Uh, that that it's going to muddy up the um, the development process. Um, have you been hearing those concerns, and, and how do you respond? Uh, yes, to uh, obviously. And I'll leave this off with uh, a statement my late wife made. And when it was uh, when she was alive, and we were talking about change uh, in various things in, in our lives and in science and everything, she said, "Rick, who is the only person that likes change?" a baby with a wet diaper, basically. <laughs> so like, nobody likes change, okay, let's face it, because they have their own mindset about how drugs should be developed. But we really looked at Project Optimus, and it was not just a, uh, a well, we woke up one day and we decided, well, this was a problem. This had been a problem that has been festering in oncology for many decades here, uh, and became really more pronounced as we had more drugs on the market. Uh, we had better understanding of the diseases, what were the appropriate doses that needed to be done rather than just using uh, the vast, uh, the, the largest amount of drug you could give to a patient. Now, uh, doing that, uh, giving the largest dose of a drug can lead to some disastrous consequences. And we've seen, you know, uh, many drugs, in fact, an entire class of drugs almost uh, 
going off the market because they were delivering too toxic of a dose of the drug and then comparing them to a much more tolerable therapy. And they actually had inferior survivals mm -hmm. associated with this. So that was intolerable, okay? We could not allow that to go on. So we really had to draw a line in the sand and say, we really need a, a more attention to dosing in oncology. Um, I, I think this is a, a really important point because here again, the dose is the foundation. Mm -hmm. And I always make this analogy, build with building a drug development platform, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, adjuvant studies, et cetera, and you don't have an adequate dose is literally building a house on quicksand, okay, mm -hmm. if you want to use that analogy. It's just going to fall apart. And, you know, any any money that is invested or any time that is invested up front is always a better uh, avenue rather than waiting to uh, later on in drug development and then questioning, ah, do I have the right dose? Should I change the dose? you know, that gets into a problem. Other therapeutic areas have done this, okay? Oncology is the only subspecialty that I know of that just says, well, give patients the maximum tolerated dose and that's their problem, so to speak. And we've also heard from patients, the patient voice has become uh, more pronounced here saying, we're not willing just to take these therapies. And one has, if they have, you know, just very high degrees of toxicity. Uh, this really boils down, Nathan, to uh, not not more time, but more careful planning. Quality. Planning from a drug development point of view, okay. Uh, and yes, it may be a little additional time, but if one really carefully plans on what their drug development scheme is, it's not that much more time that one needs, but it, it really is the foundation of the drug. Uh, and here again, there's no other therapeutic area that I know of that would just say, well, patients should be able to tolerate or should tolerate uh, hair loss, nausea and vomiting, hospitalizations, sometimes drug deaths associated with this. Uh, and one has has to question whether that is fair for patients. You and also mentioned this in your book about equipoise. You mentioned one of the investigators said, you know, we, I, I can't rightfully enroll my patients on a trial if the comparator arm I know is to be inferior. And so there is a question of whether equipoise is maintained. And you also alluded, I'm wondering if you could talk about this a little bit more. In the era of social media, the internet, patients are hearing about these products even probably before um, they come out in some of these uh, FDA approvals. What was it like hearing about that from investigator, uh, from the investigators? Well, I think that um, in, in the case of um, Ibrutinib, it was probably one of the first, if not the first um, major cancer drug that um, uh, was fueled uh, not just not social media necessarily, mm -hmm. but but definitely well, yeah, by, by social by by the internet. You mm -hmm. know where yeah. where um, you know people heard about it uh, from blogs, mm -hmm. patient blogs. Yeah. Uh, you know we've seen an incredibly robust uh, patient community in, in many many uh, different indications develop online, mm -hmm. uh, and the secret kind of got out. You know yeah. this thing, this this thing works. Um, and and people wrote about it. Um, uh, there's a, a, a terrific uh, doctor actually who, who has CLL um, who uh, developed a blog that is now the CLL mm -hmm. Society, uh, a terrific resource for CLL patients. Um, and people would follow his blog yeah. and his uh, journey uh, on um, on ibrutinib. He participated in one of the early trials, and and that specific blog I think uh, played a big role in um, getting the word out among mm -hmm. the patients that, hey, and the people who care about those patients that you should try to get on one of these trials. Mm -hmm. But that was the the genesis, basically, of the whole breakthrough concept, right. okay? Uh, and the thing that sparked the breakthrough concept was this, uh, in another disease, uh, in melanoma, okay, mm -hmm. where we saw, you know, profound, large response rates uh, with the BRAF and MEK inhibitors, okay, uh, which in a, a disease that had really no other therapy other than uh, DTIC, which I frequently refer to as a toxic placebo with a marginal, marginal response rate. Uh, basically, uh, could randomized trials be done? 
without allowing crossover of patients, mm -hmm. okay? And we felt that that was uh, not ethical, not to avail patients to uh, additional uh, ability to receive the drug by crossing over at the time of progression. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was obviously our, our standpoint. Uh, I, I know some people have criticized us in the book that we were the people that said there should be no crossover. And I assure you that that was not mm -hmm. the case. And we responded back to uh, some of those editorials. But uh, we view that this is something that has to be addressed in a clinical trial when you have a really very active drug and you're developing in a setting where the control arm may not be as active. Right, right. So it's a real challenge, I think, okay. um, that I, I guess does get more complicated uh, with the publicity associated with Can social media. Can I just media. ask, I know this is about you and the uh, yeah, right. <laughs> your work, but I'm curious, Rick, because, uh -huh. um, you know, you're mentioned in the book uh -huh. and there are some very specific details about your life and how you see things, quotes and so forth. How did you feel you were represented? Is it accurate? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not entirely, okay. Uh, two points that I'd like to make is uh, the allusion uh, in the book, and I, 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 I'll ask Nathan to comment on it, that the key opinion leaders that came in had some in, uh, undue influence on our decision-making process. And one of the things that I've always been asking people to do is, uh, you know, uh, we we have the disease experts here in in, in the in in the agency. We have over a hundred medical oncologists. We know the diseases. Okay, uh, it's about the data, not about anecdotal experiences with one investigator or another investigators. So generally, we make up our minds before we enter a meeting uh, about what our stance will be on a particular issue here. So uh, the the role of these people that the investigators, the academic physicians that come in uh, and their influence on the agency, I, I think was uh, not entirely correct, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I don't change my mind just on somebody's statement. It, it's really what the data shows, and I, I think that's important. Uh, the other issue was uh, the, and I mentioned uh, my wife previously, is the type of transformation that my wife's uh, illness had on me as a drug regulator. And I think uh, a lot of that came, you never talked to me, by the way. Mm -hmm. Thank you, or not thank you, <laughs> okay. Uh, and not doing your work, <laughs> okay. But I, you took that from the, New, England, from the uh, New York Times article. And that was somewhat misportrayed, okay. Obviously, when a spouse goes through a devastating experience, such as my wife had ovarian cancer, as many of you know, and died of the disease. That is going to have an impact, obviously, uh, in how one views not only their work, but their entire life, basically. Uh, and, and I think it's important to realize that, but did it have a transformational nature on our decision-making here at the agency? And the answer to that is no. Okay, and that was not well represented either in that New York Times article uh, and in the book. Uh, our, our decision making is based on really the quality of drugs that are coming to us. It's not based on emotional decisions that we make based on a personal experience here. And what we have seen, obviously, as we mentioned throughout this entire uh, two decades, uh, starting with the approval of imatinib, is a progressive improvement in drug development, which allowed us to approve drugs on the basis of single arm trials because the response rates were no longer 8%, they were 80%, okay, they were 50%. So it was obviously that many of these drugs in various diseases were working. Not that I had some transformation that somebody knocked me over the head that there was a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a reason to change our philosophy. This was all based on basically what the data showed. So thank you for not talking to me and getting it wrong in the book. Oh. <laughs> so, since you didn't talk to Rick before, I imagine you had a perception of what Rick might be like from talking to yeah. the people you did talk to and from reading these articles. Is he what you expected? <laughs> it's hard to know. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, Rick um, uh, called me up uh, after the book came out 
and um, I didn't complain about it. Though. No, <laughs> no, he, he, uh, and um, he was really excited about it. And mm-hmm. um, we talked for at least an hour, um, and uh, he we kind of ex- exchanged ideas uh, about uh, what I'd written. And what struck me was, um, um, you know, Rick Rick has forgotten more about cancer drug development than than I could ever know. Uh, and and yet he seemed really interested in um, the a, a different view of mm-hmm. this game, for lack of a better uh, term, that takes place around around cancer drug development. Um, he was like genuinely interested in um, you know what it looks like from a different vantage mm-hmm. point, either mine or from industry. Uh, and I I thought that that was really terrific, especially for someone in his position who's been doing this for a long time, uh, that he was really far from stuck in, you know, one way of looking at things. And um, that, that I thought that was, that's the big takeaway I've had from, from spending time with Rick, uh, both recently and, and during our conversations uh, since the book's come out. Any people that did not get mentioned in the book that should have? Absolutely. You know, um, there are a lot of challenges in writing a book like this, uh, uh, including um, uh, dealing with um, uh, government agencies that frequently don't allow uh, their officials to speak to the media. Um, uh, One is that drug development takes a tremendous amount of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're talking like, you know, in some cases, 10 years. Uh, and then even then, you still don't know what the impact of that drug really is until mm-hmm. it's been in the population mm-hmm. for a while. Uh, it, it, it takes a long time. Um, and um, it's a team sport. Uh, this is not tennis. Uh, it's, it's not swimming. It, 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 um, there, there are so many people that are required uh, to, to develop this uh, sort of outcome to, to get a cancer drug to patient in industry, in, on the regulatory side, in government. Um, and uh, they all their contributions are all required. And it's simply impossible to put that in a readable book. You know, uh, there are just too many people. And even the people that I did include, I don't think I fully captured the extent of their complete contributions. It's just not not possible. Um, and so it was really hard for me to make decisions about, you know, who to include, who not to include, which of their contributions to, to spend time on. Uh, it's a subjective thing at the end of the day. Um, but what really did strike me in, in researching the book and writing it is uh, how many uh, uh, people are involved in this process. You know, I have a friend who works in the movie industry, and he always says it's it's a it's a miracle when any of these things get done. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think the same could be said for sure about um, uh, oncology medications. It's just a miracle that any of them get done. I think timing also plays a big role in it. Rick, do you want to tell everyone your favorite phrase? Because in the end of the book, you are talking about the, you know, when can this, should this drug be said? When should it be? when it should be sold, and you mentioned, you know, $1 billion is where really the threshold is for a blockbuster. Mm-hmm. And as Rick always says, timing is everything, right, Rick? Well, it's what's the difference between salad and garbage? Mm-hmm. Timing, basically. And so much of life is timing, goes. And uh, as you pointed out, you know, having the right person at the right time at the right place. And obviously, the story of a brutinib was there that led obviously then to the second molecule mm-hmm. or would that second molecule even got launched if it wasn't for the knowledge that this other drug of the same class had uh the uh was i don't think so i think yeah. it, was, it was a fast follower yeah. Yeah. It, it was a fast follow, follower and mm-hmm. very interesting and uh, be interesting for you to kind of comment on the two people that really kind of were so much involved with both the initial abrutinib and then the calabrutinib trial because I think they go through and are weaved throughout this entire book and if you would like to kind of sure I, you know um, you asked me about the characters or the people involved who I, I uh, liked um, one of them was is Wayne Rothbaum um, who um, it took me 
two you know two years to get him to speak to me. He, he normally doesn't talk to the media, um, and um, but once once I got him to open up, um, I just really enjoyed uh, spending time with him uh, and and learning from him, uh, and he. He, he was a, a, a hedge fund manager, essentially a stock picker, uh, who, who um, invested in the company that developed Ibrutnub um, really almost before anyone else. The stock was trading for about a buck, and uh, no one really cared about it at all. Um, and I think he was one of the first people to really understand um, uh, the target in this case, which is BTK. Uh, and, and and the potential of blocking it and what that might be. Um, and he really kind of dug in and, and got to know the science and, you know, put his money where his mouth was and, and bet really big. Um, and then and didn't, didn't he sell kind of too he early? Got too? Spooked. <laughs> he got Timing. spooked. He got spooked uh, because of some of the noise and the data. There were some issues with uh, lymphocytosis and, and um, so, some uh, questions about safety. He had also invested in another company that was trying a similar approach called Calistoga, um, which was a private company. Uh, and it was also experiencing some issues uh, around its product. So he got cold feet. And he sold uh, the majority of his uh, stock in this company, uh, which uh, ultimately the stock reached uh, $260. So, so he lost out on most of 10 to 260. Um, and he kind of started, uh, which I describe in the book, a, a whole other company and developed a whole other drug uh, that was um, unlike Ibrutinib, um more specifically selective. created, selective. so it was selective, and, and it, it was created to be a, a medicine. Uh, you know, ibrutinib was a tool compound. Uh, it wasn't designed to, or with the intent. It was people didn't think it was covalent. And, and Merck had that drug initially. Uh, are we allowed? To, uh, it was a, a company called um, a Solera uh -huh. uh, that, that yeah. owned it, um, and. Um, so, so it created this whole other company uh -huh. and this whole other, Wayne did, this whole other, uh, helped push this whole other drug over the finish line. Uh -huh. uh, and now the majority of new patients uh, who take CLL take a calibrutinib, uh, the drug that, that he helped develop. Um, so it, uh, to me, that's really an incredible story about, about um, uh, science and innovation and um, people making mistakes and um, picking themselves up and, and, and doing the most with, with it afterwards. Uh, and I think that it's had a huge impact on patients. Mm -hmm. So is it the character that sort of brings the book out of you? I mean, you're writing articles all along. You're you know obviously invested in the development of what's going on right. in the news. Right. But at what point do you decide, I'm going to write a book about this? What drove that decision? I told you, all I want in life is a really good story, <laughs> and and no matter what. And this, to me, um, uh, you know, when I first thought about writing this book, some people suggested that you know these two drugs, um, there there were no television advertisements for them at the time. There are now, but but not mu much. They weren't famous. You know, there are other drugs like uh, one in particular I, I have in mind that uh, was developed for arthritis. Um, that that you know there's Super Bowl ads around that yeah, drug, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so um, you know they said, well, why are you writing about these relatively obscure cancer drugs, um, even though CLL is a large population? Um, and the answer I had was because to me this story was a very extreme. L let me tell you something: 2010 to 2020 mm -hmm. biotech, it was a scene. Okay, it was a scene. All right, uh, it, 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 it there were big changes. Biotech taking the innovation baton from from uh, from pharma, uh, uh, a huge explosion in in the stock market in biotech companies. Um, uh, a lot of really uh, interesting science that was taking place, um, new regulatory. It was a scene, all right? You couldn't help it. You had to write it. It was a scene. And to me, this story kind of exemplified that scene the most. It, was, it had extreme characters. Uh, um, it, 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 these drugs are extremely helpful to patients. The financial outcomes were very extreme. Uh, one of these drugs was sold for an implied valuation of $42 billion, uh, just that drug. 
Um, and it, it was sold around the same time as a company you might have heard of called Genentech, which was the foundational biotechnology. So we're company. talking about Ibrutinib was sold. Yeah, Ibrutinib was sold for an implied valuation of forty-two billion, which is almost as much as Genentech was sold about for. The whole company. The whole yeah. company that in, in, essentially invented the whole field. Um, and so, um, you know, to me, the. the the, 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 this, these sort of extreme outcomes and the extreme uh, characters involved, and you know, it's, to me, it's at the end of the day, all of this is about human beings. You know, these, you know, I'm, I'm a would big... some of this fall under the rubric of irrational exuberance, Exa so to speak. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> as far as the dollar, the amount. dollars, yeah. Well, we could talk about that. Um, I think. Well, here there's, again, there, there's an the, interesting. The second drug, about, no, you know, um, I would say that that it, you know the company uh, that that purchased um, AstraZeneca, uh, sorry, the company that purchased the Calibrutinib. Um, AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think they're pretty happy with that. Yeah. With that but but here again, uh, you know, th you describe in the book the kind of jockeying mm -hmm. between the major pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies to get access to or to get the deal made mm -hmm. with uh, uh, pharmacyclics. Mm -hmm. And obviously that went to Abby, right? right? Uh, and uh, there's a quotation from Adam Furstein in the mm -hmm. book from mm -hmm. Stat, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you'd like to comment on that. I, I thought, I, I chuckled when I read it, because it deals with people going to a bar, basically, and having multiple rounds of drinks, I think, and knowing when the right time to leave is. And if you don't know when the right time to leave is, you're going to make some fatal mistake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, do you want to comment? Well, that was that was you know Adam's a very talented uh -huh. uh, 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 journalist who covers biotechnology, and that was his comment at the time. Uh -huh. uh, I think it, it proved to be accurate um, that um, you know when when that deal took place, that uh, it seemed like. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's that time in the day, in the night, when it's time to not have that last drink. You know, you should go home um, and uh, not keep the party going. Um, but, you know, as you said, it's about timing. A different pharmaceutical company uh, purchased essentially a 50% stake in Ibrutinib um, a few years earlier, earlier on in the um, investment process. Oh, it was uh, Johnson uh, J&J. And um, that... Um, that company uh, had made a great deal. You know, they they bought half the drug for a billion dollars, and um, again, the implied valuation of its stake was twenty-two billion dollars. Shortly afterwards, um, so timing is a big part of it, and a lot of that is a risk-reward analysis that, that that these companies have to make. It's it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, you talk a lot about you know, the emphasis, obviously, is on the smaller biotech companies, but obviously there were a lot of interactions that were going on with large pharma, uh, established pharmaceutical companies, the AZs, the a AbbVie's of the world, the Merck's, etc. Um, comment to us, especially the people uh, that don't work in this industry, the difference, the cultural differences between small pharma, big pharma, and what are the advantages of it? What are the disadvantages of these differences, potentially? Um, you know, obviously, as we said before, the smaller companies have an ability to be much more nimble. They can do things um, in tandem, not sequentially, uh, more easily. They can focus all of their efforts and resources, including time, which I think is a big, big one, uh, on um, a, you know a few products or one product. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies. The big ones um, have a harder time doing that. Um, you know, the big pharmaceutical companies have incredible resources. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for later stage trials, um, they can do things that smaller companies cannot do. Uh, or not do as easily as they can do it uh, because well, of the and resources we saw they have. For example, the class of drugs that have been greatly developed over the past 10 years have been the PD-1 drugs. Right, and right. Some of these drugs have so many indications yeah. uh, that the product label is unmanageable. And they made a cameo appearance with, in your book as well. Yeah, yeah well, drugs. again, because uh, of the luck in, that was involved, uh -huh. uh, the company that uh, Merck, since we're, uh, that uh, uh, developed uh, uh, the most famous PD-1 uh, drug. Um, in fact, for all intents and purposes, that drug is Merck today. Uh, it's it's the, the biggest uh, driver of its of its revenue. But they had one of the PD-1s that, I'm not PD-1s, but one of the, yes. was it a Brutinib that they had? No, they, had a, a they had a Calibrutinib. And, and they sold it for a thousand They sold it for a thousand dollars. Talking about bad decisions. <laughs> yeah. And okay. they almost sold the PD-1 
uh, which is now their whole company. And at the very last moment, it, uh, so someone wised up. Uh, my reporting showed that it was on a term sheet at one point. Uh, and they wised up and they didn't sell it. And, and uh, I mean, that company is very you know, grateful that and its shareholders are grateful. And then they wanted that. to, they sold it for a thousand and they wanted to buy it back for a billion. Later they thought about buying it back for a billion. Um, big and difference. Didn't, and and, didn't, and, didn't, and when the price was going to exceed that, they had a hard time thinking about how they were going to explain that to, to their board. That would be um, difficult. Would be difficult. <laughs> right, right. Um, so again, that's another example of, of timing and end of luck. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we frequently see, because we obviously uh, deal uh, from a regulatory perspective with small pharmaceutical companies and large pharmaceutical companies, uh, is uh, really the, the need to have adequate capitalization to do randomized trials. And this has been one of the major problems that led to some of these companies not doing confirmatory studies after accelerated approval. They want to kind of push the drug to accelerated approval push it over the approval net and then sell the drug basically and then worry about mm -hmm. the accelerated approval confirmatory studies later which produces uh you know significant issues here mm -hmm. um any thoughts on that the need for adequate capitalization because all we're asking for many times is a randomized study uh, and they can't even do that sometimes i i uh, i think it's reasonable <laughs> for uh i mean the rules of the road seem to dictate that um that the confirmatory study occur, I think it's reasonable to hold uh, a company's feet to the fire. Uh, in, in my book, um, uh, there was no confirmatory uh, um, study done uh, with ibrutinib in mantle cell lymphoma, which was the first indication uh, that it was approved for. Um, that turned out to be a strategic mistake uh, forget uh, public safety, uh -huh. uh, because it allowed another drug to come it allowed another drug to get an accelerated approval, which uh, its oh, biggest competitor, yeah. right? Uh -huh. um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, it made me question: like, do these companies just forget about? Uh, but I, I don't know, like why? Oh, no, they, yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. Yeah. they, they have letters with yeah, documented right. timelines and, and stuff on them. We recently, for those of you in the audience uh, that follow the FDA, we had a, a recent ODAC this month on, on that topic, uh, and one of the companies didn't do the drug, but have been for nine nine plus years or 10 plus years, uh, a confirmatory study, which is uh, really uh, outside the limits that anyone would consider due diligence, obviously. Uh, but, but it is an issue of, uh, you know, having adequate resources because we're always in this balance. Obviously, the FDA as drug regulators want the most robust drug development package. We have to make a decision. And on the other hand, poorly capitalized companies bring experts around, academic experts, and say, well, what is the minimum that we could get? And we right. frequently see that even with uh, single arm trials where we ask for 100 patients and then it goes to 90, then it goes to 80, and then we have to like, no, this this stops here, so to speak. But it, but it is this tension that we are always facing, whereas with some of the much more larger pharmaceutical companies, especially when they know the drug has a, a great deal of activity, uh, that they'll launch numerous phase three trials, not just one. And we saw that with the PD-1 drugs, mm -hmm. uh, that there were, even if a trial failed, uh, not failed, but failed to meet its primary endpoint, that there were backup studies that allowed them to move those studies into the slot for confirmatory studies for accelerated approval. Mm -hmm. But we frequently hear from sponsors, you know, uh, in our closed meetings with them that we just don't have the money to do this. And our, our response is, Unfortunately, that's not our problem. And what you're doing is putting your financial risk onto the patients. And that's somewhat intolerable because as we all know that if the drug was truly a great drug, there should be a line of suitors there that would want to partner with them. And then if they're not reaching a negotiation, why mm -hmm. is it basically due to the fact that these suitors have do, done due diligence and the drug isn't as 
proposed okay. or that people are just simply too greedy and want the drug approval because obviously they could sell the drug after it's approved for a much more financial rewards than an unapproved drug, obviously, right? Even before we get to that point, Nathan, in your book, you talk about these large professional society meetings, AACR, ASCO, ASH, and we haven't talked about that and, yet. And ASCO, a ASH is coming up. And ASH tell is us coming about the up. fur coats. Yes, story. I was going <laughs> to ask about that. Um, well, um, this, this, the CEO of Pharmacyclics um, uh, had never um, uh, worked in biotech or mm -hmm. biopharma uh, prior to uh, running Pharmacyclics, and he had a very unconventional approach. Uh, he, he was unconventional mm -hmm. just being in that position. And um, the story I heard from so many people about him was that he, when he showed up for the first time at ASH, uh, you know, Pharmacyclics was just starting to transition. You know, it had it previously had not been involved in blood in blood cancer. It was just transitioning to blood cancer. So he goes to this huge uh, hematology meeting, and um, he shows up in New Orleans. It was cold, uh, cold, uh, uncharacteristically cold for uh, New Orleans. For a stretch in New Orleans, uh, uh, it's colder than it is here in D.C. today. <laughs> and uh, he showed up in a, in a fur coat and walked through the the uh the poster hall wearing the the fur coat and that got a lot of people's attention uh okay. just because it was so <laughs> so unusual um but look th these are really important uh events uh mm -hmm. th these meetings uh i think they're important for for the regulators they're important and, and we see a lot of investment people at these right. meetings a and it's ton, very important for a the ton science. of yeah. investment people that are doing side meetings with investigators and uh other companies i take it but par primarily with investigators because they come you know we view these meetings as scientific meetings mm -hmm. uh you know to present new data uh for the benefit of eventual clinical trials and patients whereas people that are in the investment banking are looking at it as, as investment opportunities, who to invest in, who not to invest in. Yeah, and the companies meet with shareholders because everyone's there, you know, it's like an, it's an opportunity. Right. Um, you know, in my book, I write about how um, uh, Ahmed uh, Hamdi, who at the time was uh, the chief medical officer at Pharmaceutical, viewed these meetings as a recruiting opportunity to recruit people to uh, his company. Um, so I think they're, they're just a way for all the stakeholders to kind of get together uh, and network and, and pursue their interests. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's amazing in the age of the Internet, but as I write in the book, um, at that same ASH meeting, uh, Pharmacyclics presented a little bit of interim really small number of patients of, of phase one uh data and and the scientists were really uninterested in it and and paid it no attention but um an investor from new york accidentally stumbled across this poster and he looked at it and there were two partial responses uh on the poster uh, for ibrutinib of, in cll and he goes wow that, you don't see that every day uh and that resulted in the investment firm uh, that he worked for um, becoming one of Pharmacyclics' biggest I shareholders. I build on that yeah. because you, the timing of how much data do you show, do you show it when it's early on, do you wait until you have a little bit more data was also something that came out and is important. I wonder if you could expand on that a bit. And that was true, especially for Acalabru, yeah. because yeah. they did not initially... They wanted they, to they, keep they, it. They were very close yeah. and, in fact, angry that one of the employees had an abstract and then later on once the drug showed great activity were more than happy to kind of tout the benefits yeah the i think there was um you know there were competitive pressures and you know the comp the company was run uh by someone who um was very you know kind of paranoid and secretive and uh he wanted to withhold the data until he felt it was ready for mm -hmm. prime time you know ready to really be seen uh and um he that that remained the case until really uh, they released the data uh, concurrent with a, a an Egem article uh, on on that on the on that trial. So um, the timing matters, and 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 I don't know that there are right or wrong answers about this, but but uh, you know people try to be strategic, uh, you know about about when and where to release their data. Mm -hmm. We asked Nathan to 
give us a question or two that he wanted us to ask, just in full disclosure. Uh, and the one that I like the most, because Rick, this is something that you often say, is that, you know, we just need to make sure we're having fun. That's the idea of uh -huh. being engaged. And, we're know, having fun here, folks, even if it We hope you are, too. <laughs> so what is, what was the most fun aspect about putting this book together, about doing this research, about what you learned through this process? Um, Which is I, your question. Yeah, no, I, I had a lot of fun. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I really enjoyed, uh, because this is such a highly regulated industry, um, there are a lot of clues that you can find. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the clinical trial database, um, uh, the uh, regulatory documents that are found. I was able to find, uh, you can just geek out on this stuff. You know? it's, uh, it's, I really enjoyed it. Like, uh, you know, I found, I found um, you know, minutes of meetings uh, that took place in this building, uh, uh, you know, b between uh, the, the two companies and, and the regulators. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of times what I found in the minutes or in the emails um, corresponded with what people were telling me anecdotally. Were there uh, conflicts sometimes? No, no, no. Okay. In fact, I, often I would, th that was how I would corroborate what, what was true. I mean, you try to like triangulate and corroborate. And, and one of the ways I was able to do that is by looking at the public record. And it's extensive, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's a lot, you know, the number of patients, the res it's all kind of, um, uh, uh, Pharmacyclics was a publicly traded company. There was a lot of data that it shared in its uh, Securities and Exchange Commission filing. So um, I really enjoyed kind of like hearing people's stories and then seeing, ah, they are, these guys are being accurate. You know, they're, they're telling you the truth. So um, it, which um, you can do in this industry because of the regulation, but not in every industry. Yeah. And part of the reason I asked that, because I sort of assumed it was the research for you yeah. and the geeking out, yeah. is that oftentimes when um, we're meeting with patient advocates or others who are really less familiar with the process mm -hmm. of you know how this all works and comes together, mm -hmm. sometimes people have, I think, just the general misconception that the FDA is hiding something and that, you know, how many times we heard the ridiculous myth that we really do have a cure for cancer, mm -hmm. but we just don't want people to know and there's some kind of financial, you know, I mean, it's... It's too bizarre to even explain. However, <laughs> people seem to think that, you know, and it, it's Conspiracy. one of those things that, yeah, yes. it's, it's just, it yes. grows legs and, and they, until they hear it, I think from a third party, you know, mm -hmm. we could say it all day long, but if, if people are hearing it from somebody who's actually researched and taken a really deep dive into some of the workings of what goes on here to actually bring these drugs to market and mm -hmm. cancer in particular, because mm -hmm. it is its own separate box. Uh, I think that there there is sort of a hesitancy, and maybe it's just sort of a general mistrust of government. I don't mm -hmm. know, but I think there is sort of a hesitancy unless people hear it from you know an independent author who has no reason to be kind to us. Um, you know, they, they they still wonder. You know, or is the FDA holding something back? You know what I'm saying? Well, you I, I that? think one of, one of the problems is uh, we're kind of a closed box. Obviously, mm -hmm. we can't when we don't approve a drug, uh, we can't say why we didn't approve the drug. Okay, this is not true in Europe where they do uh, issue their uh, kind of complete response letters, the equivalent to that, or their summaries of, uh, of their reviews. But uh, that does not happen here. So you would not, if these drugs were not approved, you would not have as many times the same access to corroborating material. And many times what we find is when we uh, are silent on an issue and uh, uh, don't approve a drug, many times what the companies may say may not be uh, entirely correct, okay? There's some shades of gray there that, uh, and these are not sins of uh, commission, but sins of omission that generally occurs uh, with uh, some of the companies when they're describing non-approval letters. And that's why there obviously has been a great deal of interest in making documents more mm -hmm. accessible to the public, which would require some law probably to be done. Uh, but uh, that's one of the reasons why we take drugs, many of the drugs that we're not approving to an ODAC meeting. Uh, so there is a public 
discussion of exactly what the FDA has found. So uh, the public is fully aware, including investigators, other drug companies, uh, patients, et cetera, of what maybe, our rationale is. Maybe explain is. to someone who might not be familiar with what ODAC is. Oh, what it's, it is. Uh, it's our advisory committee, uh, Oncological Drug Advisory Committee, and it's a, uh, a meeting that we held periodically to discuss specific applications, uh, usually regarding their approvability, non-approvability, uh, and it's composed of outside experts uh, and includes patients, consumer representatives, biostatisticians, uh, clinical uh, medical oncologists uh, that are there. Uh, there's an opportunity for the public to comment in the uh, public hearing. There's a presentation by the uh, drug sponsor of the drug uh, and a, a, a presentation by the FDA. And then usually there's some type of voting on uh, risk benefit of a drug uh, from the data that has been presented. Yeah, I, I think you're touching on an important topic that I've thought a lot about and I'm deeply concerned about. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there is um, a, a tremendous amount of uh, distrust in the public mm -hmm. with the drug development process, um, not just with, uh, you're, you're focusing on the regulatory aspect of it, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I mean in totality. Uh, and um, I think a lot of it is driven by the high prices of, of drugs. Uh, and um, uh, the outrage that exists around, around the high prices of drugs. Uh, and as a result, uh, there's a, lot, a lack of public trust uh, in all of the institutions that um, are stakeholders in the drug development process. Uh, and so, um, you know, while I understand where that animosity and, and comes from, um, I was hoping, and, and I, I think um, this might be too ambitious, uh, but I thought, well, if, it, if, if I could write a book that in some tiny way, you know, mm -hmm. somehow can, you know, and I think, you know, I, I, I try to um, show this process warts and all, you know, I even upset the, you know, the, 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 the oncologies are, right? Like, I, so, you know, uh, so I try to, to, um, to, to tell the story as accurately as possible in order to show that we actually do have an incredibly robust process in this country uh, for um, developing uh, oncology medications and getting them to patients. Uh, and we shouldn't, you know, um, take that for granted. Um, you know, n no one does it like like we do it here. Uh, in my opinion, in the, you know, in the United States, there there are you know a lot of international uh, contributions that are made. Of course, uh, one of the companies that I write about uh, in this book uh, has is based in London, and I think has done really extraordinary work uh, in oncology uh, over the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you know. So I was hoping maybe if I could make one small contribution, it would be to kind of show the process, the good parts of it, the parts of it that should be improved upon, um, the parts of it that are flawed, as all human endeavors are, um, and but also give some people, uh, leave them with the idea that, that, um, that we have a very robust process uh, for, for doing this. And, and uh, you know, we've done a a lot of terrific uh, cancer medications have been brought to patients uh, over a relatively short period of time uh, to the extent that some people feel that there's kind of a, a golden age, uh, which I hope will continue uh, in this in this area. But, you know, that brings us to another issue, uh, and we've talked about this previously, motivation of people, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, everybody says, you know, they're in the business because of the patients, obviously, but many people are skeptical when we're talking about billions of dollars changing hands. Mm -hmm. Is it about the patients, and is that a veneer hiding uh, more for lack of better words, sinister aspects of either uh, financial rewards, and they are quite, quite significant for some people, making them 
multimillionaires where they would never have to work in their life again. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's, for the academic people, uh, and even people in companies, being associated with a winning drug, for example. Mm -hmm. So you have multiple layers, and it's very hard for anyone to assume what some individual's motivation is, because uh, nobody can get into somebody's head, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm wondering, as, as you spoke to people, what did what was your feeling of motivation, or is it um, almost impossible to tease out this issue? No, I think out? I think people are complex. They have multiple motivations, mm -hmm. obviously, for the things that they do. I, I told you, I, you know, I think uh, you know, Bob uh, uh, Duggan uh, was was to a large extent motivated to get into this game mm -hmm. uh, because his son tragically uh, passed away from from glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was trying to create something positive out of this deeply tragic uh, event. Um, so people have different motivations. Uh, and, um, and I think that for a lot of people in the industry, um, um, helping patients is one of them. And, and that's terrific. Um, I do think that, um, you know, there is a deep, conf one of the things that I found interesting in researching this book, I, I know that there is a lot of confusion in the public about the role that money plays in the development of life-saving medicines and the ethics around that. Um, but I was surprised the extent to which um, even within the industry itself, there seemed to be a lot of confusion about it. Uh, people don't like to talk about it. Um, uh, I have this whole part of the book, this very micro issue of, on stock options and, and dilution, and that seemed to confuse the, the, mm -hmm. the PhDs who worked mm -hmm. at these companies. That, that you know, they, they could literally cure cancer, but 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 they or cure they can you know literally help patients with cancer, but but. Um, um, uh, you know, they struggled uh, with some of these other concepts. And here again, nobody's going to say I'm in it for the money because that's just too crass. <laughs> Fair um, enough, but but but, uh, but, but that's money. but you know what? That yeah. is how our system. Some by me, you know. That is how our system works, yeah. uh -huh. and, and and you know, um, I, I, I've said this before, but the, the Economist wrote a nice review of my book, and at the end of the review, the reviewer asked a really terrific question. Uh, they, the reviewer said, you know, I've just read this book and I see all this cash soaked testosterone, innovation, science and sharp elbows and egos. There's got to be a better way to develop life saving medicines. There's just got to be. And um, there may be. But but um, we know that this process produced almost 400 drugs, uh, a lot of them oncology medicines, between 2010 and 2020, and, and a lot of them were good drugs. Um, and so, you know, I think that is how our system works. And, you know, the Chinese haven't found a way to do this in a different way. In fact, the Chinese companies that bring drugs to market are doing it the exact same way that we do it. They list companies on the NASDAQ and, and they have the same, they're making the same risk reward calculations as we do, uh, and, and you know, part of the reason that the process is expensive is because we have high regulatory standards in this country, as I believe we should, uh, to protect um, to protect uh, our citizens. So, you know, it, it, you know, I think that 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 money is part of this, and and it seems to be because of the, the stakes are so high. Uh, pe people seem to struggle with that concept. Yeah. You mentioned 400 drugs, but I, I, I do want to mention that behind that number, there is duplication. Sure, obviously. Sure, sure. And, you know, we have written about this uh, extensively and discussed it extensively about the problems of PD-1 drug development. Mm -hmm. How many of these same molecules do we need? You know, we called it the wild west of PD-1 drug development. Mm -hmm. uh, how to get drug companies to work together? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and that is one of my major concerns as I move forward in, in my career is uh, uh, there's a need for obviously the free market system, but there's also a need for uh, people working together. Because uh, here again, how many of the same thing do we need? And certainly the prices aren't coming down in our current 
uh, schema of drug reimbursement. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when you have all of these multiple drugs out there, the investment in those multiple drugs, which are not making any advance, it's like a sideways line basically should that drug be that money those dollars be used on more innovative concepts mm -hmm. even in basic science concepts but looking at different newer molecules taking more risk rather uh, here again i fully realize that the whole idea of the pharmaceutical industry or one of the guiding principles is risk reduction but there's risk reduction and then redundancy also. Right. Yeah. And how to strike that balance. And do you have any comments on that? Well, I'm hoping that innovation will um, help us find a way out of that box. Uh, so I'm actually a little skeptical about it. But for example, um, a lot of people um, are uh, very excited about innovations around artificial intelligence <laughs> and how that might change the game a little bit. Um, so. But that sort of optimism uh, and that sort of uh, innovation, I think, might uh, solve some of these problems uh, that, you know, are just kind of classic economic problems, you know, that issue. Because we, we see that, you know, not only in the drugs, obviously, but uh, which drug to use, obviously, uh, in vitro diagnostics that are necessarily to identify competition there, uh, you know, and not sharing material. And, and in the book, you, you mention, I, I believe it, it's uh, with the uh, Asserta company and their interactions with J&J, &J, uh, wanting to do a randomized study and how to get uh, the abrutin drug from them. Do you want to go into that? Because I sure. Like that I mean, was I kind of the uh, uh, as I document in the should book. Should I say it? <laughs> <laughs> I won't say it. <laughs> um, uh, Asserta was unable to, uh, for, you know, uh, this agency. Uh, Required essentially uh, Asserta to do a trial, uh, you know, with with Ibrutinib. Uh, and um, Ibrutinib is an expensive drug, uh, and uh, they were unable to get access to to that drug uh, from the companies uh, that that own it, that produce it. Uh, and um, there were a lot of letters that went back and forth, and it was just very clear to the assertive folks that they, they weren't going to get it. Uh, so they had to find uh, creative ways, uh, and they ultimately did uh, in Europe, to obtain uh, the drug at a, a price that, that wouldn't upset the entire process for them. Um, in order to conduct the trial. Because so, here again, one, one of our big yeah. issues is with more drugs on the market, we want head-to-head -head comparisons right. with the best drug. Uh, and here again, there's going to be a winner and a loser here. Right. Uh, and if you're giving your asset away, that may be shooting yourself in the head, uh, yeah. especially when you see uh, potentially better activity, uh, a safer drug. Like, do I want to give my competition a drug right. that is going to like harm my market share? So right. to speak. there's also innovation in how we think about clinical trials design. You asked Rick earlier, you know, how can we keep this momentum going forward? Mm -hmm. And you talk about basic science, but once that molecule gets the clinical trial, is there, maybe I'll direct this question to you, Rick. What are, can we do to think about innovation of trial design, dual, um, randomized studies, pragmatic well, you know, trials? We, I, I think, you know, the, the drug development scene <clears throat> has gotten way too complicated, some of these clinical trials. I, I have to sit down and, like, think about what's going on with an individual patient as they go through this arm A, arm B, arm C, and then following this therapy, they get this, following this therapy, they get this. No patient could understand this, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, and we really have to work on simplification of clinical trials and what is an essential question that we want to get so that patient could understand the clinical trial. It could be done conducted in a quick fashion with the least amount of data that is necessary. Okay. It's not like we need everything on every, every drug uh, and especially drugs that have been on the market for a long time where we know the safety profile. I always, always say that for the PD-1 drugs, we have millions of patients that have been treated. We, we know the safety. To collect uh, safety information on some of these drugs is mm -hmm. kind of doing it for the sake of doing it, so right. to speak, rather than really getting some 
information that we need. So it's really how to streamline the system because sometimes we get too complicated in our, our designs. Mm -hmm. But here again, that doesn't necessarily address, and here again, my core issue of what is going on in the pharmaceutical companies uh, of working uh, in a more collaborative fashion. And not only when it's in their best financial interest to do so. Right. And that doesn't necessarily even mean in the development of the drug, but in ancillary issues such as in vitro diagnostics, if they're looking at the same uh, biomarker that's going to be used in patient selection, et right. cetera, uh, we can't have multiple different biomarkers uh, being developed for the same marker, so to speak. Right. right. We've got about 10 minutes left in this conversation, and I, I can't resist, Nathan, you, you talked about the warts and all aspect of your reporting mm -hmm. and, and how it was important for you to really represent the full spectrum. I'm just curious, what is it that you think FDA can do better in regards oh, to... We all want to know <laughs> the <laughs> answer to that. development. Uh, We're open. Yeah, uh, I don't know that I'm. Don't worry, you, you'll get another invite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't. I don't. I think. Um, you know, I don't know that I'm well positioned uh, to answer that question. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I worry about is, um, you know, a lot of our institutions are under attack uh, in this country, and um, uh, I think that. Uh, it's really important for an institution as important as the FDA uh, to maintain uh, its rigor uh, and um, its strength as an institution, uh, while at the same time uh, listening to or try to understand what is the motivation behind some of these attacks uh, that 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 uh, were criticisms uh, and try to adapt to them at, at the same time and, and take them seriously um, uh, before you, the institution becomes overwhelmed by those by those attacks and I think that's a challenge uh, across uh, you know our, our society it, it's not reserved to uh, the FDA or drug development uh, uh, but I think th those are two you know, I don't think that we should be tearing down all our institutions. I think our institutions should remain strong and are really important, but at the same time, they need to adapt and, and listen to uh, well, one of the things that has come out in this whole criticism, uh, and believe me, we're well aware of it, is people m mixing up our mission. And, right. and they want to somehow conflate, well, this drug was approved, but the cost of this drug is so much. Well, we're not taking that into consideration. Mm -hmm. That's a whole separate issue. And many of these attacks and quotations on a specific drug approval, et cetera, uh, really have to do uh, with a concern for uh, in astronomical drug pricing. And that's not in our purview, but it's either addressed in the article or covertly and subliminally implied that this is one of the reasons that we should not be approving a drug or we should be using overall survival rather than progression-free survival. And they don't understand some of the complexities of, of what endpoint to use, et cetera. But there is this subliminal issue always brewing in this oncology world of drug cost, okay? And uh, although they realize that we don't take this into consideration. We don't even know the costs yeah, that we don't they will even be. know that, and we certainly don't take it into consideration, but they do in their attacks, and either it's overt Because you're part of the system. Yes, mm -hmm. they're overtly right. mentioned this, or expensive. underlying is this mm -hmm. issue of, of drug cost. And right. I, I think that is one of the bugaboos that, uh, you know, the criticism uh, exists, and it needs to uh, really separate the drug cost from uh, approval standards, etc. And also people have to understand that drug regulation is a dynamic process, right. okay? Uh, and there are changes that occur in science, in society, uh, and uh, the acceptance of, of risk benefit, okay? Uh, 
over the past 20 years, as you mentioned, we have had multiple uh, drug approvals and these have changed the landscape of the disease, okay? So our, our tolerance for safety, et cetera, have to be defined. The dosing issue, it's time to address that issue. I know people don't like that, but it's time, folks, okay, to address well, this issue. It depends, issue. right? Because if you're experiencing toxicities, yeah. you want some somebody yeah. to say, hey, and, this and dose what, is too what much. people have got to understand, we're taking a look, there's the immediate needs of patients, okay? And then there's the long-term interest of patients, future generations of patients, which we're looking at. And it's always this dynamic that we're dealing with of the immediate needs of patients. And that's why accelerated approval, breakthrough therapies came up, primarily accelerated approval to address these immediate needs versus the long-term interest. And that's what the confirmatory studies are about, the long-term interest of generations of patients that are going to be coming. Uh, and that's a dynamic balance. But, you know, you know, we're constantly looking at what's changing in the field. There's multiple new, new drugs, so our our tolerance for the data that's coming has to be higher, okay, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a situation where people do have other options here. Uh, and, and I think that's important for people to understand that it is not a static process, but uh, a process that is changing and continues to change as far as uh, endpoints that are used, uh, the fact that we may not be able to use overall survival because uh, of lack, lack of equipoise, because of long natural histories of diseases. For for example, in multiple myeloma, 20 years ago, you could use all, uh, overall survival uh, as the endpoint for the initial treatment of these patients. However, with patients living now 10 years, that endpoint is ridiculous. One could not use that as the primary endpoint to show an improvement in, and that we're forced to look at uh, other endpoints. Change can be beneficial sometime. Nathan, as we're wrapping up, I think we're all wondering what's next in store for you. Is there another book or is there another product you already have in mind? Is there a podcast based on Rick? <laughs> yeah, give us a glimpse. I can't see beyond lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's a real pleasure uh, uh, being here with you all today. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed it and uh, really appreciate you taking the time. It was a great event to be a part of. And, and, and as I said, you know, my, my reason for having Nathan here is we see what goes on the FDA staff here uh, in our meetings with companies. We don't see what happens behind the scenes, so to speak, in these companies. And I know this doesn't represent this book entirely what goes on with every company and with all the industries, small pharma, big pharma, et cetera. But it's always fascinating to see these glimpses. And we've been in contact with many of the people that were interested in or were portrayed in this book and to see their actual role behind the scenes and not just sitting in front of us at a meeting is really one of the reasons that I want wanted Nathan to come and speak to our staff here because uh, it does give us this kind of opening in the curtain, so to speak, of what goes on behind the scenes. And we appreciate your time. And thank, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Final comments from you, Jenny? Anything? No, I want to echo what Rick said. It's really remarkable to see what goes behind the scenes because we have been asked by many people, hey, we would love to be a fly on the I'm wall in some of these FDA meetings. And my counter is, I would love to be a fly on the wall in some of the meetings that you have. So thank you again for uh, joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a special edition, right? Absolutely. Special edition yeah. of Conversations on Cancer, the intersection of society, drug development, and drug regulation. Well, okay. Got and it. making cancer personal, right? Yes. So we just add that to our tagline. I just want to thank our audience for joining us today. Um, again, Nathan, it was great having you here. And, you know, if you do something else about FDA, we definitely want you to come back, whether or not you do. And do call us. We're more than interested in talking to you. We're here when we're interested. Okay. Um, we also do want to let our audience know that we have, obviously, more conversations on cancer coming up in the future. And the next one actually is in January on the 10th, sort of a year-end review of some of the work that we've done. I can't give too much away because, you know, can't get out in front of the regulators. Um, but then we also have a couple more coming up in February, the shortest month of the year. We actually have two conversations on cancer planned, one of which will be international with the European Medicines Agency. 
uh, and another one that is will be our sixth anniversary for our OCE Black History Month conversation on cancer, where you'll probably hear some more behind the scenes from some of our staffers. So you don't want to miss any of those. We greatly appreciate every time you join us. And if there's somebody that you know who might benefit from hearing this conversation, these are also recorded and available on our website here at the Oncology Center of Excellence, Conversations on Cancer. So thanks, everybody. We appreciate you joining us and hope you take good care. Bye-bye.